Morning everybody, welcome Hi. to worship this morning. Um, after the uh, thunderstorm and the sunshine and all that, I thought we could start with uh, reading Psalm 19 this morning. Because Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no word. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out to all the earth their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. Let's pray together. Lord God, we ask that you be in all that we do this morning with this act of worship. Join with us, fill us with your spirit as we worship you and draw us near to you. Amen. It's great to have Bruce with us uh, to bring the next in our series of prayers from the Bible. So uh, over to everybody else. Good morning, everyone. Today's Bible reading is taken from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 18 and verses 9 to 14. And it's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that that man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. Thanks be to God. Amen. Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells the story of two men, a Pharisee and a tax collector. One day they both went to pray. Let's imagine they went to a church. Now the Pharisees prayed, thank you God that I'm so wonderful. Thanks that I'm better than John and Bob and especially that awful Beryl. Did I mention how wonderful I am? Now the tax collector, he could only think of how terrible he was. He couldn't even look up to heaven. He just said sorry to God. Please have mercy. Now which prayer do you think God heard? Okay, so we've heard the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Mm -hmm. And now I've got two parcels. One of them represents the Pharisee. And this is the Pharisee. Why do you think it might be a Pharisee? Oh, it's all clean and wrapped and pretty the most bow. Yeah, and if people saw it, what sort of thing might they assume was on the inside? Well, something fancy like gold or something. Yeah? So you might assume that if you got this present, you were going to get something really amazing because we generally assume that what's on the outside is reflected on the inside, don't we? Mm -hmm. So we might look at this and think, oh, what a special, it's a special thing. It must have something really special inside. Okay, right, so if this is the Pharisee, um, I'm going to put it in there. And now I've got a jar. And what's in the jar? Smarties. <laughs> um, in fact, today they're not Smarties. They're God's blessings. Have you got it? Yeah. <laughs> if they really were God's blessings, they 
it would be a huge gown and it would be full right up to the top. Yeah, it would be overflowing. We don't have enough smarties for that. So. No. <laughs> okay, so we're going to pour God's blessings into the Pharisee. Because mm -hmm. when we pray, we're praying for God's blessings really, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah? So we're going to pour God's blessings onto the Pharisee, into the Pharisee. What do you think is going to happen to the God's blessings when we pour them? Well, they won't go inside, will they? Well, have a go. We're going to try and rescue God's blessings. Oh dear. He can't really receive them, can he? No. He's too prettily and tightly wrapped up. Okay, well let's rescue some of God's blessings. Okay, and we'll pour them back into the jar. If we can. Maybe. Don't don't let them spill. <laughs> Okay, so if that was the Pharisee, okay, this is the tax collector. And what do you think of this box? Well, it's just a bit muggy and yucky, isn't it? Would you, want, would you want to even look and see what was inside this box? No. No? It looks fit for the bin, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's all squashed and muddy and tatty, but there's a difference between this box and that box. This one's all closed, and this one is open. It's open. Okay. So I'm going to pop our tax collector box in the tray now, and we're going to try with God's blessings again, okay? So we're going to pour God's blessings into the tax collector, because when he prayed, he was praying for God's blessing. He wanted God's forgiveness, mm -hmm. didn't he? Right. Oh. What's happened? They're overflowing. They're overflowing and he is absolutely full now of God's blessings. And do you know what? I'm going to let you, <laughs> he's out there, that's the tax collector, I'm going to let you enjoy some of the overflow of God's blessings from that tax collector. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I might enjoy some too. Let's pray. Lord, help us to be humble like the tax collector in the story. Jesus, we ask you to teach us to serve others, to think of the needs of others before our own. Help us to admit when we have made a mistake and to ask for forgiveness. When we get things right and do things well, help us to remember that it is because of your gifts of talent, strength and opportunity that we succeeded. Help us to be like that open box, open to your blessings and open to learning new things as we walk with you. Amen. Good morning. Well, we're carrying on this series on prayer and the prayer that I'm going to look at today in a small way is the prayer of the tax collector who said, oh God be merciful to me a sinner. If there was an overarching uh, message, uh, I would call it the scandal of the cross. I call it the scandal of the cross because the word, the Greek word scandalos is the word that's used to interpret uh, Paul's uh, word when he talks about uh, the offence of the cross. The actual literal meaning of it, if we whittle the word really down, it actually means a trigger, a trigger of a trap. Um, and so the cross triggers things in us that perhaps we would rather not be there or uh, a response from us that, what, that uh, commands us to think. Um, again, I want to emphasise, as we're going through these really tumultuous times, through the lockdown and coming out of the lockdown and the fears and the worries there are of a, a second spike and also the financial uh, fears, there is a, a, a palpable sense of anxiety, a palpable sense of fear and also anger. And one of the things 
one would ask is, well, where's God in all this? I mean, there may be many interpretations that God is, is sort of standing back and just watching, or others might say, well, God is judging us. Well, my perception is, 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 is that God is suffering. He's suffering as a, in the midst. He's being crucified afresh amongst us by some of the, th the, the anger and the violence that we've been seeing on television. Uh, and wherever we see these things, whether they be in our own hearts or whether we see them on the television or whatever, um, God is suffering. God is right in the middle of it. And although Jesus died once for all, in a sense that cross is continually being reenacted by the way we treat one another. But God is not just saying, you're, you're hurting me. God is also saying, I'm hurting with you. And I understand why that you're responding the way you are. So God's suffering uh, among us isn't just some sort of, uh, how can I put it, uh, passive response, uh, passive thing that's happening to him. Because God is actively engaged with our pains and our sorrows. And uh, we read in the Bible about Jesus being touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In all our afflictions, our God is being afflicted. And the closer we get to God too, if you, you begin to feel the pain of others. And if there's an argument going on, you begin to understand that that person is responding because of the pain that they're going through. So the first thing is that God is... Where is God? God is right in the midst. He's the fellow sufferer who understands everything we're going through and is with us all the way. Now, in attachment to this particular passage that we're reading, one of the major problems that I'm seeing, uh, and especially thanks to social media, but also, you know, just kind of picking up the whole vibe of what's going on, there's a lot of people who think they're so right and there's a lot of people who are fighting for rights. And maybe that these are two problems that we can address today when we look at this parable. The first is being right. We all know what it is to be right. Right is such an intoxicating thing, isn't it? I mean, it's interesting, it can also be toxic as well as intoxicating, especially when our rightness is uh, is gained by by a sort of ego elevation on on somebody else's wrong, and we judge others, and we get some sort of moral kudos from it or whatever, and we also associate the whole uh, business of religion and of Christianity about being right. Well, I've told you time and time again that that's not the essence of, Christian, uh, of the Christian message and not the essence of what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to make us right only, not primarily. Obviously, there is, even in this parable, the man goes out being justified. But his primary purpose is not that we should be right, but that we should know that we're loved. The other thing is that we have our fancied rights, and I say fancied rights, but it's the same grace that shows us that we're not right, also tells us that we don't have rights, um, and that our life does not consist of um, claiming rights in this world, but our life in God consists of what is just freely given to us. And the cross exposes these two problems that we have, being right and having rights. In the first sense, it shows us that when Jesus died on that cross, he wasn't suffering for his own sin, he was suffering for our sins. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was made sin for us. He was, he was a representation of what our condition truly is. And when we look at what the uh, the solution, or should I say, the uh, uh, the the remedy, we we realise how bad the condition is. But the other thing we see is not only that we we we're not right, but we're wrong. Uh, we also see we have no rights. 
Now Jesus was the one who had rights, but we're told again in the Bible that um, he, even though he considered equality with God, uh, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped at. He emptied himself. He let go of rights. And if anyone had rights, it was Jesus. Uh, uh, but we have no rights because we are so wrong. <laughs> and so the cross is a great leveller, isn't it? Black or white, gay or straight, Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, doesn't matter what category you are in the cross lays the axe at the root of the tree it's the great leveler and we're all found to be sinners as christian and the bible tells us very clearly all have sinned and come short of the glory of god there is none righteous no not one and all of us have been uh, pronounced uh, under uh, as, as sinful and so that's the first scandal of the cross and it's quiet it causes problems when we say we have no rights because when I watch TV and I watch and I listen to a lot of people uh, uh, they would say well surely we have to stand up for the rights of the marginalized and the answer of the cross is what rights nobody has any rights so how can you stand up for something that, is, that doesn't exist and Judas had the same thing. He said, what about the rights of the poor? He said to Jesus, this money that uh, this uh, perfume this lady was pouring on Jesus' feet, he said, it could be used for the poor. What about their rights? And Jesus' answer was, the poor you shall always have with you. That's not, a, that's not, um, that's not going to win many friends. But that's what Jesus said. Why did he say that? Well, it's a bit of a mystery, really, but... He was saying that there's something more important uh, 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 than uh, the poor or that I'm going to do that will do so much more uh, than your efforts to uh, level the playing field amongst the poor and the marginalised. And of course, Judah's intention had nothing to do with the poor. He was a greedy man. But there is a way that seems right to man and the end thereof is death and the way of the cross is a scandal and a challenge and a stumbling block to us all and you may say well hang on a minute what can we do then if no one has any rights do we just sit passively by and just let everybody suffer well of course I'm not saying that we can help people, we can give, we can, we can give everything we've got uh, for the sake of the poor and uh, for the sake of the oppressed. But what we can't do is do it as though they've got rights, because they don't have any, neither do I. We're all fellow, uh, we're all under grace and that's all we can share is grace. So we can't go down the streets saying you know these people have rights not for at least from a biblical point of view and so the answer whatever the answer is if if we bypass the cross and we raise the angry fist on behalf of the rights of others i can only say and i say it with sadness uh, but i say it with certainty that the end result will be worse and I think we're going to be seeing it in the world later on unless there is a spiritual renewal in the world. Now let's compare Christianity and you know as well as I do that Christians, uh, it, Christianity is, is the religion that is being most persecuted in the world today. As I speak, people are suffering atrocities in the name of Jesus Christ. In China, churches are having the crosses. Uh, it was in the news yesterday, crosses ripped down. It's still going on in China. Nobody cares. And, uh, but you do, you do get reports. You get reports from Iraq, you get reports from 
all over the world. There's a, a magazine that came through the post today called Open Doors and tells you what's going on around the world. And it, it's heartbreaking what is happening with God's people. But what I don't see is anybody with a, a um, any symbol of a fist, say with a cross in the fist, uh, saying, uh, you know, Christian lives matter. You don't see anything like that. That's just not the tone that we're seeing. Because from the Christian perspective, um, the tone is totally different. They're saying, pray for us. Please pray for us in our sufferings. Sometimes they'll say, pray for our enemies and pray for our country. But there's no shaking of the fists, but just the broken heart. And people who find mercy at the cross, uh, they, you find that they don't fight for their rights because they realise they don't have them. It's a hard pill to, to, to take when we feel so inspired by the world in its protests and its militancy. But the power of the cross and the reality of the cross calls us uh, to let go of our rights, to let go of the sense of right and to hold on to the centrality of God's mercy and grace. Now the second scandal I want to talk about is that God justifies the ungodly. Now that's a real one. Uh, the fact, I mean, We've, we've had the story read to us and it's about the Pharisee that goes um, and with his head held high. We'll look at that in a minute. But interestingly, Jesus told this story uh, for, for those who trusted in their own righteousness. He didn't say, this is a story about the Pharisees. Uh, Luke said, this is uh, you know a story for those who trust in their own righteousness. Because if he said it was about the Pharisees, we could all just, you know, sort of load the whole thing on the Pharisees, which I've seen done quite sadly, actually. Uh, but what he's saying is, look, everybody can do this. There can be Christian people uh, uh, relying on their own righteousness. There can be Islamic people. Everybody is capable of trusting in their own righteousness. And so this is for us all. Anyway, we see, of course, the Pharisee going in. He's upright. He's looking into the distance because, of course, his God is a distant God. He's up there somewhere. <laughs> and, of course, he was right. He had his rights. Let's imagine he'd been going there for 40 years and, you know, he'd, he'd kept every uh, act of worship correctly and uh, he was he was a good tither, he fasted, and all these things are brilliant. And he'd been doing this for 40 years. But then we have this little guy coming in who's a tax collector, working for the Romans, like Zacchaeus, uh, bowed, looking down. Let's say he's just popped in for the first time. But he's beating his breast, and he's bowing down, and he's crying, Oh God, have mercy on me. Now that's a scandal because what happens, this guy that comes in who's not been to church before, into the temple before, he's the one that goes scot-free. Not only is he set free, but he's been given, he's been, it says he's justified, he's given the righteousness of God. And furthermore, there are no obligations placed upon him other than that to know that he's loved. Now that is scandalous. I mean, can you imagine the Pharisee? Going, I've been doing, I've been coming here for years, a little bit like the prodigal son's brother. I've been working for you for years. And this guy comes along and you just bestow all that upon him. And of course, we know the differences in his approach. To the Pharisee, he was looking down on the tax collector. And he said, I'm glad I'm not like this man. And it was just sheer arrogance. He was so filled with his own sense of pride and his own sense of righteousness. He was saying, in, as, uh, in effect, like the, art, the guy who was getting painted by the artist. And, and uh, he said, I do hope you'll do me justice. And the artist said, you don't need justice, you need mercy. And uh, 
This man needed mercy, but he was thinking he was getting justice and that God owed him something. Well, of course, the scriptures are very clear that God resists the proud because it's contrary to the spirit of the cross. The sacrifices of God, say the Bible, are a broken and a contrite heart. He doesn't like the lofty and the proud heart. And of course, the word mercy means be propitiated to me. And so the, the, not only was he looking down was this man, but in a sense, we can read into it, he was looking to the sacrifice in the temple, where the cross was be, uh, as we see it from our point of view, is central. I say there's no obligation placed upon the tax collector. He went out scot-free and that's true. But there are expectations. I mean, God doesn't, uh, God's love for us is free and he do, he, we owe him nothing. It's absolutely free. And no, there's no control. You know, oh, no, I've done that. You owe me this. No, he's loved us freely. And yet, although he makes no demands upon us, he so knows the power of his love and his goodness that he has great expectations about what that love can do in our lives. And so, with the Pharisee, now there's a pattern in history about the oppressed becoming the oppressors. There's a, a little poem I found by Blake that says, The hand of vengeance found the bed to which the purple tyrant fled. The iron hand crushed the tyrant's head and became the tyrant in his stead and I've often mentioned about the school teacher who's teaching the story about the the Pharisee and the publican and she says to the children oh children well we're glad at least we're not like that Pharisee and in so doing she's become the Pharisee and so the tax collector can become the new Pharisee the new oppressor if you like and this happens time and time again in his history and the call to the cross for us to recognise we have no rights and we are not right. There's another step for, forward for us to go with the cross. It's a step not just about the cross doing something for us, but we entering into the cross itself and being, as I mentioned I think last time, crucified with Christ. Where our brokenness and our contrition of our fallen condition is transmuted into humility the humility of jesus the humility of the son of god who emptied himself well let's just summarize we've looked at the tendency of this present time more than ever to be a people who have been putting right and having rights at the center of our agenda and the scandal of the cross is twofold we are wrong and we have no rights. And the second scandal is God proclaims right those who are wrong. Now, how you interpret that in today's world would be very interesting. I'd love to discuss it with you. God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's our prayer. It's a wonderful gift for us to have that prayer. And we can be sure that God will bless us. Not bless us in a superficial way, but the very centre of God's glory is situated with his grace and mercy. It's not something we attain to. It's something he brings to us when we humble ourselves. It tells us that he delights in mercy. It tells us that his throne is a throne of mercy. There's a green rainbow around it which speaks of mercy if you read the book of Revelation. It's a place where rather than being afraid because we're wrong and we're going to be judged, when we come like the tax collector, it's quite the reverse. It's the place of glory and joy where we are loved, where God is touched and feels all that we're going through and identifies with our pain and our suffering. One more thing is I've been thinking is why, why is God attracted to the likes of the tax collector, to the broken and the contrite? 
Is it because he's come some kind of big guy looking down and he just likes to see us grovel? Or something like that. Or it's, it's fitting because he is God and, and we are just lowly sinners. I don't think so. I think what God, why God is attracted to the humble and the broken is because God himself is humble. It's a hard thing to associate to the one who we see as the king of the universe upholding all things by the word of his power because we always associate power in a kind of Trumpian fashion in some sort of uh, macho uh, uh, alpha male thing but it's not like that at all because our God is truly humble we only have to look at Jesus and so we fellowship and we're united with God and so what begins of abasement we become elevated and we become partakers of the divine nature and so there's our prayer for today God be merciful God be merciful to me a sinner I get loads of things wrong and I'm sure you do too and it's an absolute joy to know that there is a place that we can go and we can find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. God bless. Good morning everybody and welcome to our final prayers which I'm going to pray around the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you first of all, Father, that you are indeed our Father. And therefore we are your children and we can come before you as children, making requests just as our human children do to us. And we know that you are just as anxious indeed even more anxious to grant our requests and to hear our prayers and to answer them in whatever way you see fit so we just thank you for your fatherhood help us to realize that we are your children so we bring our needs before you your kingdom come we pray and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, despite the fact that this world may not acknowledge you. Lord, we do. We know that you're the one who's in control. So we bring before you all the situations going on in the world at the present time, especially the pandemic. We pray that you would be very much involved in meeting people's needs in that our own needs, those of our family, our friends, people close to us, people that we know. We bring them before you and we ask, Lord, that you would deal with them. We just want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you that your will is indeed done in heaven that there there is no evil, that there is no darkness, that one day when we're there every tear will be wiped away and there'll be no more crying and no more suffering. But here we are on earth with all our many and varied needs and we need you to be involved in them. So we pray that you would bring the pandemic to an end as speedily as possible. We pray that you would be with people who are suffering indeed people who are dying, people whose jobs are affected for the economy, things that seem completely out of control, but they're not because you are in control. You are the Lord and you reign on high. Help us to look to you, Lord, and not to the problems and help us to see you resolving the problems. And we do pray that you would give wisdom and guidance to those in charge who are trying to sort them out. Do help them and give them strength and help them to look to you for wisdom. 
Give us this day our daily bread. We pray that you would meet not only our physical needs with food and drink, but also our emotional needs, our mental needs, our mental well-being, our spiritual needs. These are things, Lord, that we cannot do in our own strength. We can only ask you, Lord Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit to empower us to do what we cannot do in our own strength. So do that, Lord, we pray, and meet all our needs. Help us to know your strength right now as we commit what situations face us into your hands and as we place them firmly at the foot of the cross to remain there and not to be taken back so that you can sort them out. Forgive us our trespasses, we pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We bring before you anything that needs to be confessed, remembering the words of Scripture that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in the sure confidence that you will do that, we do bring anything before you that needs to be sorted out and leave it with you, Lord, to do just that so that we might experience your forgiveness and thank you for that forgiveness that completely wipes the slate clean and restores the relationship we need to have with you. And if we harbour any bitterness for a sin committed against us, which we found it really difficult to forgive, again, in your strength, help us to be able to forgive whatever that wrongdoing was, maybe something that's still ongoing. Help us to be able to forgive, Lord, even a stage at a time. And thank you for your forgiveness. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lord, bring to our minds now anything that needs to be confessed, any temptation that we, f we struggle with. And again, strengthen us and help us. May your strength and your love and power overcome these temptations we pray and do we pray deliver us from the evil one who would seek to blight our lives and fill us full of fear and a feeling of being out of control remind us lord every moment that you are the one who is in control who loves us and cares for us and cares for every situation and we bring before you any situations affecting friends, members of our own family, work colleagues, possibly things in our own lives as well, that we feel overpowered by. And we invite you into those situations, remembering that you are the great resolver and that you do resolve things that we think cannot be sorted out but that's not true they can because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever 
Amen. May God bless you all.